Good morning again, and what a what a marvelous set of words or sets of words that we just sang, and uh, proclaiming truth and and saying what really matters. That's so very important in these days, and uh, especially after after a week where. We're surprised and shocked and horrified and disappointed or angry or glad or and all of the various emotions that that we experience in times like this. And I felt the Lord leading me, uh, giving me thoughts that I want to share with you and I'm reminded about a question that you can see on the screen as well. How did I lose my way? Good for us to ask sometimes. <clears throat> a long time ago, several decades ago, I was busy, very focused on learning the Ojibwe language. And one of my favorite language learning exercises was to listen to stories, especially hunting stories, especially moose hunting stories, especially successful moose hunting stories, because those are actually the only ones people tell, generally. <laughs> and so I, I listened to a, a lot of those, and for some reason, I, I hunted in many different ways, but one method of hunting especially fascinated me, and that was tracking moose in the snow. And I really wanted to be successful at that. I really wanted to learn how to do that. And being a smart younger man, this is all quite straightforward. And it's, the, it's about this simple. At the end of every set of moose tracks, there's a moose. At the end of every set of moose tracks, there's a moose. So, so it's logical, follow tracks, find the moose. So I went looking and I found fresh tracks and I followed them. And this was in mature forest, so I couldn't see very far at all. And I was being so quiet and so careful and walking in fairly deep snow and following this set of tracks, a single set of tracks. But all of a sudden, I saw a separate, another set of tracks that sort of intersected with the moose tracks I was following. And I was a novice, but I soon figured out those were mine. My tracks and the moose's tracks intersected for just a little bit, not for long. Because from that on, that time on, the moose tracks went another way and they were running tracks. See, moose hunting, following tracks, thinking we know where we're going is not really what you'd think. For some of you younger hunters or even older ones listening who don't know yet, if you follow the tracks of a moose in the snow, I can almost guarantee you, you'll never see it. Unless, of course, you're out in a big clear cut or someplace where you can be careless like that. But I had to learn from those who had more wisdom than me. I had to learn from those who, who knew how to fix this problem. That if you follow a moose's tracks in the snow, you can almost guarantee you'll never see it. At least in... 
unless your visibility is a long ways. So I learned something. I learned that I can be right on track and for all practical purposes have lost my way. I, never, I didn't know that that moose was making a circle. I didn't even realize that that moose made a total circle and came back and smelled my tracks and took off. And I followed it, hoping that I would see it. It's not hard to lose our way. I'm not talking about the argument of whether or not a Christ follower can technically lose their status as a member of God's household. That's not, in my mind, even a worthwhile discussion. What is worthwhile is to be aware of how easily we can lose our way in finding and fulfilling our life purpose, our reason for being on this earth, how easy it is to lose our way in the story God has been putting together. For many years, I was the leader of a ministry agency. That's a group of people that are supposedly committed to a reason, to a calling, a mission, a destiny. I can tell you that even in a case like that, it's not hard to lose our way. It takes an awareness, it takes an alertness to prevent that. It takes the voices of trustworthy people who are not part of it, who are looking in from the outside. It takes courage to disregard the voices of some people. We need a way to know, we need a way to imagine where our current path is taking us. We need a way to imagine where our current beliefs and behaviors are going to take us. Just like when you're following moose tracks in the snow. When you have your head down, looking at the tracks in the snow, we can completely miss the best way, the actual way we ought to go. When we take all those things into account, and we take a way of wisdom. We take a way that doesn't seem logical all the time. We'll actually be a bit surprised when we suddenly arrive in the middle of what we were hoping for. I can still picture my very first successful tracking and stalking experience with moose. Over a period of a couple days, after learning some things from the ones who tell the stories, over a period of a couple days, I was monitoring where moose tracks were, but not going to them exactly. Well, you sort of do. And I watched the wind for a couple days so that I would know which way they were moving, because that was one of the key things that they told me. So after about the second or third day, I started on a path. I started on a path where there were no moose tracks. And I headed the way it seemed, the way of wisdom, the way what probably would work. And it worked. Suddenly, I was standing among moose. And I hadn't seen a moose track yet on that day. It's amazing. It's a different way of not losing our way. It's a different way of finding our way. There are numerous, teach numerous teachings in the scriptures about not losing our way once we've started out. And if we read all the stories of people in, the, in that big story in the scripture, we see so many people who had a major role in God's story and then lost their way. Some lost their way temporarily, and some seem to have lost their way until they died. Think of names like Adam, Abraham, Gideon, Samson, David, 
can go on and on. Almost every human story in the Bible has illustration, tells about how people were on the way and lost their way, either temporarily or for a longer time. And it's, it's complicated sometimes. It's not really simple. We can lose our way by following a movement of people. And we can lose our way by not following a movement of people. That's the, some of the hard part of it. It's not black and white. It's not just me being smart while others are dumb. Intelligence doesn't seem to have a lot to do with it sometimes. We just realize that one of the most intelligent defenders and debaters of our faith had lost his way for a long time, destroying his own legacy and harming the lives of others. So many church leaders in recent times have lost their way. It seems they pursued a type of success and a role of power to feed either their own appetites or to feed or to move toward an outcome that they decided was more important than considering the way. Whether it's been by finances, when by abuses of power, abuses of people, abuses of influence. And others have lost their way by simply replacing God's plan and his story with another story, another mission, another set of values, such as placing highest priority on the goals of a nation. Research among evangelicals is showing that a very large segment of younger people is losing their way in relation to trusting the church and its leaders and its people. I really believe that most of that traces back to the fact that the predominant version of the evangelical church and its message has lost its way a long time ago. And those of us without a lot of power and influence have our own way of losing our way. It's not hard to do. We see it in others. We tend not to see it in ourselves, me included. And we have answers for everyone. You shouldn't have done this or that. You just focus on Jesus. Just keep your nose in the Bible. Don't look at that. Don't think about this. Don't listen to that news source. These all are true some of the time and helpful. One of the conclusions that many come to, and I just heard someone saying this yesterday, I just need to do it on my own. People will ruin it for me. Following others as an example, as an example will lead to disappointment. I just have to trust my own judgment. It can be discouraging. It can make us doubt the reality of any of it. It can bring depression. What do we do? How do we find our way without losing our way? I can't give you a magic and final answer for those questions, but I can help you think about it again and help you to be more aware again, I hope. Let's think about two words. The journey and the outcome. We need a balanced focus on both of those. Current church stories, current political stories, current personal stories show us that focusing on an outcome with minimal concern about the journey can be a total disaster. And worst of all, it can be worthless in God's eyes. Do you know that the right outcome at the end of the wrong journey can be worthless in God's eyes. 
Let's look at a part of that journey. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise? Uh, we're... Oh, I'm going to read more than what's on the screen. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. The word power is not in there. The word control is totally missing. The word conquer others, conquer enemies, that idea is totally absent from the wisdom that comes from above. And the last verse, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. To avoid losing our way, we don't just simply say good things like this. We start designing our lives around values like this instead of listening to the voices that teach us a logical, obvious, different path. These are the tracks. That's how you follow them. The way of Jesus is not just following the tracks. The way of Jesus is a different set of tracks. He made, he made a different way, and he expects us to apply the pursuit of wisdom from above. That's the only strategy that will keep our journey headed in the right way. Not necessarily on track, as it seems to be on track, but in the right direction. And that means rejecting the wisdom from below. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, boasting, falseness to the truth. This is a contrast to the meekness of wisdom that James mentions here. The meekness of wisdom. The meekness of wisdom does not have to conquer other people. The weak meekness of wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. It's an amazing list of things. When we put those two things together, the journey and the outcome, we're back to heading uh, uh, to seeing it as God sees it and not losing our way. You'll have to take a direction that doesn't have tracks in the snow. You'll have to take a direction that puts together the many factors of wisdom that comes from above. One of the most common ways of losing our way is to obsess with the outcome, the result. When we do that, we can totally lose our way. What do I mean by that? When we obsess on the outcome, especially cultural outcomes, the logical journey is built on power rather than wisdom. 
on conquering rather than winning people. Back to the moose hunting thing. It just takes too long to track moose down like that. And so at one point, until it became illegal, people used to shoot moose out of airplane windows. It happened. You might even know somebody who's done that. Not me. These are the ways we look for shortcuts, powerful ways to get things done, to get an outcome that we believe really matters. When we obsess on the outcome, the teachings of Jesus seem weak and impotent. So we tend to join into the methods and expectations of power structures. That's why so many evangelicals have traded the way of wisdom for the way of power and nationalism. Then we totally lose our way, even though the results are close to what we wanted. The way of Jesus is a way. The way of Jesus is the journey. That's because the journey is our mission in life. The journey is the purpose for making the journey. The outcome is only the reward for a faithful journey. But we're told if the outcome is greater religious freedom, it's a good journey. If the outcome is fewer abortions, it's a good journey. Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. Just like if the outcome is a dead moose, it's a good journey. Not necessarily so. Instead, according to what we read in the scriptures, if the journey is a healthy pursuit of godly wisdom, while loving God and loving people, the outcome is both rewarding and eternally satisfying. I'll do that again. I should have put it on the screen, but I didn't. If the journey is a healthy pursuit of godly wisdom while loving God and loving people, the outcome is both rewarding and eternally satisfying. Our version of the good news sets us up to obsess with an outcome and minimize the journey. When we minimize the journey, we're better prepared to lose our way. When we minimize the the idea of the value of the journey, we're better prepared to lose our way. We talk about being saved. We talk about personal salvation. And those are very important. Just don't forget this. We are saved to a journey. We are saved to a journey. We're saved to a way of wisdom. We're saved to an entirely new story. We're saved to an obsession of, with modeling after the life of Jesus. And we're saved from the systems of the world order. We're saved from the dead end of worldly power structures. So it helps us to not lose our way when we're designing for what Jesus saved the church to. And that is to love God and to love others. Jesus described his own journey. And this is a journey, not an outcome. He quoted from Isaiah in, oops, sorry. He quoted from Isaiah when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You can change that idea. You can apply that totally spiritually if you want. 
but it's a whole package. It's a big message. And it's a journey, not an outcome. So how do we keep from losing our way? We pursue wisdom that is from above with all its characteristics. You can read those in James chapter 3. And that's so that we don't put our nose into the tracks and miss the way. We participate in the mission of Jesus as he described it. We care about the poor. We care about the oppressed. We care about the reconciling of the entire universe to God. And we wisely and carefully choose the voices and influences of those who have power and control. That means we're very cautious about adopting someone's outlook. We're very cautious about adopting the values of those who claim to know how a country should run. We're very cautious about adopting things that are, seem so logical. The tracks are right there. The moose is standing at the end of those tracks. And this is what you do. It's not always like that. The way of wisdom backs up and says, how do we carry out? How do we, uh, how do we live and apply the wisdom that is from above? And how do we participate in the mission that is the journey And we won't be sorry about the outcome. God bless you. I'm going to pray as we close this part of it. Father, I thank you for your mercy toward us. I thank you for how you lead us and help us on our way through wisdom from above. Not just the logic that comes to us from around us. Help us. Help us to repent where we need to. Help us to see how we, how I may have lost my way, how any of us may have lost our way, and regain that in your ways. Forgive us, Father. Forgive our, our people, our culture, our nation, where we have replaced your values, your wisdom with other things. I thank you and pray your blessing on everyone who hears this, who's participating through watching, through listening later. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.